Every 90 seconds, someone is reported missing. Many return to their families, but for others, something has gone seriously wrong. A 21-year-old student has gone missing. And it's like, what do you mean she's gone? She said, yeah, she just got told that she's, she's gone. Hours after finding her safe and well, she's vanished again. She managed to scale an eight-foot wall. What happens in the police investigation that follows? She was graded as a high-risk missing person. Police would respond immediately to try and identify where she could be and recover as soon as possible. What happens to the family at its heart? It was a nightmare. And it still is. I nearly collapsed because I couldn't, could not believe it. I couldn't. When missing turns to murder. I was on my own from the beginning, so it was very hard. But we managed. It was just us, so we had to take care of each other. Both of them couldn't speak until the age of four, but um, they had their twin language, to call it, their own language. So they were communicating to each other, but I didn't understand anything. They laughed a lot. They enjoyed their life. They were always doing nonsense running around, always busy, always must have something to do. They never slept. They <laughs> know uh, it's twins. They always hang together doing funny things. Janet was a very enthusiastic girl. She loved sports. She loved to laugh. They, um, she was very caring, especially of her sister as well and her friends. And she was always laughing, always. You can see any picture we have, she's laughing in the picture. The classmates were very fond of Janet. She was very, very open to everybody, and very enthusiastic and so on. Um, everybody liked her. I know Janet and Selena from scratch when they were in kindergarten. Janet always spoke very, very fast. Uh, was interested in music and so on, and uh, she had lots of friends. She just loved her life, you know. She enjoyed school, she loved going to school, and they never wanted to miss a day. She also had sometimes a bit emotional problems, I think, but uh, they, she always uh, put it together again, brought it together again. When there have been grade one students, they wanted to play soccer. They were outstanding athletes, both. They were in Emma soccer teams, and we, uh, as it is with soccer, it's with the ups and downs, you, you, you grow together a lot. Janet was a goalie, and um, she was very good in that. She was really good. Her enthusiasm was really something that stayed in my mind. Super enthusiastic, yeah, she was always, her eyes were shining, and she was smiling so much. And, and, and laughing. As soon as someone else from outside picked on one of the sisters, the other one jumped in and helped her immediately. Yeah. I have a twin brother as well, so in some way I know how it is. Even when they were older, they had the kind of same friends, so they went together with the, out with their friends and actually was never separated really. Like I said, they have been very close. They did everything together, you know, everything. The first time they got separated was when they went to the UK for university. So in the age of 18. Both of them were very excited going to UK. Exploring independence from their mum and each other, Janet and Selena moved to study in different universities on England's south coast. Janet went to Eastbourne. I think they were just um, very excited of being without me and just doing what everybody else was doing. It's student life. Janet came to Britain to study international event management. 
When students first leave home to go off to university, I think they're full of excitement, hope that it's going to be the life that they have built up in their imagination, and they think it's all going to be wonderful. They thought it's good for them, you know, to find their own identities, but I th they found out very fast that they miss each other, but of course they don't want to say it. They turn up at university, they may have been very confident, lots of friends, that's all gone. And their perceptions of themselves changes drastically. They're with people that they've never met before. And they have to start to build relationships again, as well as get to grips with whatever course they're on, handle their finances, handle homesickness, one of the uh, challenges that students do face is that they feel they need to conform. When I send them off, I, I torture no drugs, no alcohol, be a good boy, study hard, focus. When they came back in between, I asked them, how is it? And they said, man, they drink so much. They drink so, they party so much. I know that they uh, enjoyed being there. At that stage, I didn't know they were going to partying. If I would have known, they would have come back. <laughs> because you don't want your children doing any nonsense, but it belongs to life. I mean, we all have done it, if you're honest about it. You don't want this for your own children. You always want to save them and protect them from everything. It's a part of life. Other students really liked Janet. They liked her very much. They said she was great fun always laughing, um, but they did say that she kept herself to herself. So socially, they didn't really um, know that much about what she did outside of university. Janet continues through university and is approaching her third year final exams when warning bells start to ring. I didn't realize that something was going on until a point Janet called me one day and said that she's afraid that somebody follows her. And she said, Mommy, don't you worry, but there was somebody at my window and we called the police. They came, but they couldn't find anyone. I was, of course, I was worried about that, but she said they have it under control. What should I do? Is this serious? Is this just a harmless situation? Janet seems to be very frightened. I was scared, but she lived on the ground floor, so you could really just stand in front of it and look through the window. I told her, if you want to come home, let me know, we get your plane ticket. And she said, no, mommy, I have to study, we have examines soon, and, you know, she was close to the end of her university years. You think it's, okay, somebody looked through the window, maybe it's okay, you know. You, you don't think that things can go so wrong. I don't know if this has something to do with what happened happened later. First time I became aware that uh, Janet perhaps had a few issues was uh, one afternoon and Selena, her twin sister, who I'd never met before, came in with one of Janet's friends to say, you know, you've got to help us. Janet's behaviour apparently had become fairly bizarre in a way um, and uncontrollable. I heard from Selena that um, Janet had an abnormal um, attitude, that she was acting strange and running around in the house naked. Selena said she was very scared of her. And then from that point on, things went wrong. Janet Muller's erratic behaviour seems to suggest she's having mental health issues. Her twin sister Selina is keeping their mother, who lives in Berlin, updated. What was wrong? Was she taking drugs? Was she on alcohol? What is going on there? You, you worried and then I was waiting to hear from Selina. Selina keeps mum informed, but is trying to protect her from stress. I had a stroke just one and a half years before, so and they didn't want me to worry too much. So that's why I guess Selena decided to take step by step. 
The university welfare team keeps an eye on the situation. I suggested to Selina that she should ring her mother again. OK, should I come? What do you want me to do? And Selina said that she's taking care of Janet, that I shouldn't worry, and she will stay in contact with me. But Janet's erratic behaviour escalates, and Selina decides to take action. She was taken to the accident and emergency at the Eastbourne District General Hospital. They had to wait very long for someone to look at her, and she ran off, and uh, her friends couldn't find her, so they called the police. When someone goes missing, um, the first report would come into our force control room uh, and then uh, it would be routine to deploy a uniformed uh, officer to attend the home address or the place where the person went missing from. We assess every missing person report uh, and they would be graded high or medium uh, or, or low. Children uh, or people with vulnerabilities such as mental ill health uh, or physical disability would generally fall into our higher category that vulnerability would then uh, inform how we would uh, respond to that um, missing person report. Janet is found within a matter of hours in a hospital gown at a train station. She's taken to a mental health hospital. She was admitted to um, the Millview Hospital uh, on the 3rd of March. She was there on her free will. Um, when the hospital called me, to let me know about this and that I shouldn't worry, Janet is fine, they just do some um, testing. Janet was taken to Millview Hospital um, as a place of safety. She um, was assessed and subsequently detained uh, under the Mental Health Act um, because I think there were fears that she might be at risk of taking her own life. So Janet was there really for her own protection. But they always told me, no matter who I was talking to, she's fine, she's fine. I tried. Um, to talk to her. I was telling her I want to talk to her and they said I have to call the patient phone which was never answered by anyone. Selena went to visit her. She called me and said, Mama, Janet is very, very, very bad. She's in a very bad state. She's not well. And I was so upset. So I called the hospital and told them. I said, what is going on here? Why are you telling me this and this if my daughter is calling me and telling me something else? It was distressing. It was distressing for them, I think distressing for everybody involved. Janet remains in Millview Hospital. Ten days later, there's more worrying news. On the 12th of March in the morning, um, Janet went missing. She left the hospital and shouldn't have been able to do so. She's yeah, reported to have been suicidal. She headed out of Brighton to the north to a local beauty spot called the Devil's Dyke. It's in the countryside. To get there, if she was on foot, and I'm fairly sure she was, she will have walked for at least an hour. Janet was found later that morning through concerned reports by the members of the public and returned to the hospital. She should not have been able to leave. She was actually, at that point, supposed to be in a place of safety that was secure so she couldn't just walk out. And she should have been under close observation. Mental health hospitals shouldn't be prisons, but equally, you know, they are trying to be secure. Janet remained there until late evening um, and we had become, become increasingly agitated uh, and decided to leave again um, through an insecurity within the hospital. Janet was supposed to be placed under close observation uh, and yet she managed to go missing from the hospital again later the same day, very late at night. I understand it was a while really before she was, before her disappearance had been um, noticed. It's 10.15 on uh, the 12th of March. Um, the member of staff saw that she was not in her room they realised that she'd left. She was immediately reported um, as missing and that resulted uh, in an assessment. And she was graded as a high-risk missing person uh, due to her vulnerabilities and mental health 
um, that police would respond immediately with physical searches of the streets, um, contacting family, friends, associates, places she may have visited uh, to try and identify where she could be and recover as soon as possible. And then things happens fast. Selena called me and said, my mum Janet is missing. She's gone. And it's like, what do you mean she's gone? She said, yeah, she's told that she's, she's gone. Through um, questioning of the staff, uh, uh, we understood that she exited through a fire exit. She managed to um, leave through the garden where she would have had to have scaled an eight-foot wall. The hospital said, yes, she's gone. But I shouldn't worry. The police knows and they will look for her. And I just shouted at them. I said, why haven't you called me? Where is she? What happened? And they just, you know, tried to calm me down, telling me everything is okay. I shouldn't worry. The police will look for her. Uh, having suffered a mental health crisis, she was very vulnerable. Uh, and having uh, psychotic episodes, uh, as described by the staff, put her at more risk than someone who had the capacity to um, make decisions. The concern is her exposure to, to serious harm. I couldn't understand what was going on, and I was, of course, I was worried. Selena asked them to call me to, to tell me, but he didn't. Janet was reported uh, uh, to have left the hospital uh, with um, thin clothing, a jacket, a long sleeve jacket, and a um, short skirt just above the knee, uh, exposing the legs. So. It, it was not really the, the appropriate clothing that you would wear for that time of year, which again heightened our concern. Sussex Police issued a public appeal for help finding Janet pretty quickly. Knowing Janet was missing, I still was thinking that maybe she'd met somebody or she'd gone off somewhere and I kept thinking apparently she didn't have any money. I just thought she must have gone somewhere, she must have met somebody, she must have rung somebody and they've picked her up and she will be found. It's likely that she was in a disorientated state uh, as she had uh, taken her medication earlier on which would have possibly taken effect. She had no access to funds. We know then uh, from the inquiries that we later carry out is that she is um, on foot in the Port Slade area uh, and at uh, around 10.30 she's seen to be walking past the railway station uh, at Port Slade. She was seen on the CCTV camera uh, emerging from the subway. She seemed to be on a mission. To, but, but maybe that was just to get away from somewhere she didn't want to be. Uh, perhaps it was heading somewhere she did want to be. We don't know. At around uh, 23.48 hours that evening, a local taxi driver uh, saw a person who, uh, of similar description to Janet uh, in the, the Trafalgar Road area. 23 minutes past midnight, she, uh, Janet was seen walking southbound on Boundary Road uh, in Port Slade, and that was captured on CCTV footage. The next significant sighting of Janet, 0108 hours uh, at the petrol station in Kingsway in Hove. At this time, Miss Muller um, requested a soft drink and she was served that. The assistant did ask if she was OK. Um, but she said she was fine and he left it as that and didn't think any more. Uh, she was on her own at that time as well, so there was no suggestion that she'd met up with anybody. At 1.13 hours uh, on the morning of the 13th, we have CCTV footage uh, that captures Janet crossing the road and approach a vehicle, someone was in it, but it's unclear from the footage as to whose vehicle that is. Um, she leans towards that vehicle, um, and then she's seen to walk away from that vehicle uh, towards Seafield Road. And then that was the last sighting that we had. Then there is a gap of a number of hours. The concern is that um, Janet, in that situation, was on her own quite late at night, 
um, walking in a disorientated state uh, and unclear as to what her intentions were. Uh, so my concern was very much that we needed to find Janet as soon as possible. Janet Muller has escaped from a mental health hospital. She was reported missing three hours ago. In a place like Brighton and Hove, where there are so many security cameras, it seems surprising that there was so little for the police to go on. Still in Germany, Mum Ramona is at her wit's end. I was very confused. I, I couldn't understand. And at that point, you don't think anymore. You know, you, you, you can't bring your thoughts together. You just try to organize things. You just try to find out what is my next step. What will I do? So I booked a flight. It's 12 hours since Janet was last seen. 20 miles away, police get a call. A vehicle had been found in a track just off Rosper Road near Crawley. It was a private track. Someone nearby saw a burning car. A local resident um, had noticed smoke and then a male walking away from that vehicle. So the uh, resident contacted the police and the fire service uh, who attended very quickly. It was very clear it was a suspicious incident because the body of a deceased person was seen uh, in the boot, a young female. Her arm was sticking out of the boot of the car and uh, her body was difficult to identify. And the female was found um, partially burnt. Uh, it was unclear who that person was. We had no uh, information that enabled us to identify her at that time in the first, first hours of the investigation. I went over there at the airport in Gatwick. I called Selena and I said, Selena, where are you? I'm in Gatwick. So she didn't know I'm coming. She said she's in Eastbourne, so I'd say, OK, I'm taking a train, I'm coming to Eastbourne. I became aware of that there was an outstanding missing person report uh, and that it was a, a young female student. There was slight similarity from the person we found in the boot to the missing person report. And actually, it could be Janet, uh, but we needed to confirm that. We were able to carry out some fast time DNA um, investigations. The deceased person was, in fact, Janice Muller. Janet's body was found uh, within hours of her disappearance on the um, Friday, the 13th of March. Ramona was aware her daughter was missing and came to Britain to try to find her and arrived expecting to start looking straight away for Janet. But Selina had to break us some very bad news. At the train station, Selena came to me and, and was crying, and I just looked at her and I said, Selena, no worry, we will find her. And then she said, Mommy, they found her, she's dead. I didn't know. I came to the UK and didn't know that she's dead. And Selena had to tell me. And I just started screaming. You were paralyzed. I was just screaming. It's like, what are you telling me? I, I couldn't believe it. it. I really can't tell you that, you know? It was just like, what is going on here? I said, Mommy, I saw the police told you. I saw this is why you're here. I said, nobody told me anything. I'm here because... I, I thought it's time for me to take care of the situation, to relieve you from that responsibility. Still reeling from the shock of this horrific news, Mum Ramona soon learns this is more than a tragic accident. I just knew that she's dead. 
but it never crossed my mind that she got killed. And then they told me what happened, how will they have filmed her. The devastation was overwhelming for them both. Um, confusion. Um, it was important uh, myself and my team um, gave them confidence. The challenges we faced then was trying to build that picture as to her, her last hours. How did it move from a missing person inquiry to a murder investigation? What happened in between? It was unclear how Janet had ended up in that vehicle uh, and what relationship Janet had with the driver. And we had our, our scenes of crime team uh, working on the vehicle to ensure that we recovered Janet's body without disturbing too much evidence. The pathologist will want to attend such a scene because of the unusual circumstances. Um, we'd need probably a fire investigator to attend. They would look at, actually, is there a deliberate fire here? It was clear that this was not um, self-initiated. During the hours that she went missing, she'd received uh, an injury to her head um, through blunt uh, force trauma um, that would have rendered uh, Janet unconscious or at least stunned. Um, and we know that she was in the boot of that car uh, in an unconscious state, but had inhaled fumes that subsequently caused her death. The investigation focused on Janet's movements, the movements of the vehicle, and identifying the driver and their movements. The police are trying to piece together the movements of the car in which Janet was found, where it's been. They're trying to find security camera footage of Janet and her movements after leaving Millview Hospital in Hove and work out how she went from Hove to Crawley. Inquiries commenced with the hiring company. Uh, we know that that vehicle was hired on the 11th of March by a female in, that, uh, in London. She was spoken to um, and she gave an account and said that that vehicle had never been in her possession. She was shown as the only um, driver for that vehicle, but CCTV footage at the hire office showed the boyfriend of that girl um, drove the vehicle away who we later identified as Christopher Jeffrey Shaw. He had possession of that vehicle up until the 13th when that car was set on fire. Janet Muller's body has been found in the boot of a burnt out car in a country lane. Christopher Jeffrey Shaw is now known to have hired that car. The police are hunting him down. We know that that vehicle travelled down into Brighton during the evening of the uh, 12th um, and it had remained in that area for a period of time till the early hours of the 13th. There was a slight gap and then it moved back up towards the Crawley area but then moved off into London. It is then uh, identified moving back into Sussex uh, to the Crawley area. He visited a local petrol station. Geoffrey Shaw places £2.50 worth of petrol into a green uh, petrol container uh, and then he placed that jerry can on the back seat of the hire car, which was an unusual um, act because normally you would put petrol in the boot of a car. So he then drove that vehicle off and then shortly, a short time later we obviously get the report of the vehicle being set on fire. At the time when we discovered the vehicle and Janet, the driver was still at large and it was imperative that we located him as soon as possible because we, we were concerned about the risk he posed to the wider public. It was very clear to me early on in the investigation, once we'd identified Christopher Jeffrey Shaw uh, as being the driver of that vehicle, he was my prime suspect in this investigation. News spreads of what's happened to Janet. I first found out when the police telephoned to say that um, one of our students had been murdered. I asked who it was and um, they said it was Janet. 
and um, I'm, so, I'm sorry. And I nearly collapsed because you'd, I couldn't, could not believe it. I couldn't. I just. And it's not something you ever think will touch, touch your life. The police have their prime suspect and are on the hunt for Christopher Geoffrey Shaw. We then mapped uh, his movements using uh, CCTV and other uh, evidence to uh, locate him uh, visiting the Gatwick railway station and catching a train back up into London. We needed to understand whilst we were looking for Geoffrey Shaw who he was. So we spoke to his friends, uh, his family, his girlfriend at the time, and the picture built uh, uh, around a man who um, was not going very far in life, potentially involved in drug supply, potentially drawing him to the south coast um, uh, to supply drugs in that area. He was described as a Walter Mitty type character, that he would embellish, tell lies constantly, uh, and make stories up. He made disclosures to his girlfriend at that time that there'd been some trouble, that he had um, caused the death of uh, a girl. The girlfriend in her statement to police stated that uh, he always makes stories up. So she didn't believe him, that, that he killed someone. So we knew that we needed to find this man very quickly. He'd gone into hiding, we'd contacted his family. Uh, we were not making progress in that area and I was concerned about the wider public safety. I appealed via the national media for him to come forward, that uh, we needed to speak to him urgently in relation to the death of Janet. Uh, and on the 17th of March, 2015, Christopher Geoffrey Shaw presented himself to a police station in London where he was arrested for the murder of Janet Muller. When Christopher Geoffrey Shaw was arrested, I wouldn't call him a cooperative suspect. He didn't want to comment. It was clear he, he didn't want to talk to us. Um, so we had to map his movements and understand why he would do what he did. The police keep Janet's family informed of developments in their investigation. The family were incredibly supportive of the police investigation. When I met with uh, Ramona and Selena uh, and explained the circumstances and how Janet was in that car and the gaps, I had to be honest and said, there are gaps here. I don't know how Janet uh, got into that vehicle, uh, why she got into that vehicle um, and how she knew Christopher Jeffrey Shaw. It was a nightmare. And it still is, knowing that she had a lot of head injuries and she got burned alive, still breathing. I just hope she was not feeling anything. I don't know what happens in the 12 hours with him. You know, we're missing that time. From the, I think it was 1.15 in the morning, the last time she was seen until she died the next day at two o'clock in the afternoon. I don't know what happened. To this day, he hasn't spoken to the police about what he did and why he did it. I was with the family um, of Janet at the trial. That must have been um, quite shocking for for her family to see the man responsible for their daughter's uh, murder. Our family liaison officers, a man and player from the Sussex police next to me, they took me everywhere because I've asked them that I want to see him. And they took me to the court. It was the first time when I saw him. Geoffrey Shaw went on trial at Guildford Crown Court, where 
he faced two charges, murder and manslaughter. I felt very strongly that the evidence um, would convict him for murder. Um, however, accepting that potentially with the account he gave so late on that he could have given on day one of his arrest, he chose to wait many, many months, changing his story. He presented uh, a defence statement that suggested that the vehicle left his possession uh, for a period of time, claiming that two males, uh, Steve and Mickey, had required him to um, get the vehicle. All he'd say, really, was that he had lent the car to two drug dealers who had carried out a robbery which had gone wrong, and they'd ordered him at gunpoint to destroy the car. Uh, he wasn't prepared or didn't give any indication as to how we could speak to those individuals. They potentially were involved in um, incapacitating Janet and that he was required to set fire to the vehicle and then subsequently realising that Janet was in the car, but it was too late for him to do anything to save her. Uh, and his defence at court was that he did not know that Janet's body was in the boot of that vehicle and effectively, in his view, in denial of any involvement uh, in her death. He said that he didn't know she was in the boot. He remembered his sports bag was in there with his trainers. So he opened the boot to get them out and saw Janet's body. He said he tried to pull her body from the car, uh, but couldn't. He left the car burning. We now know that she was alive at that point. So Geoffrey Shaw was the last person to see her alive. He left her to die. There was a potential risk that it would not be a murder uh, outcome. Uh, and that manslaughter was an alternative based on his account. Um, and so I was prepared for that and prepared the family for that potential outcome. On the information he provided, it is our duty to um, corroborate that. We, we carried out reasonable inquiries to understand whether that was true. The inquiries did not result in identifying those individuals. Christopher Jeffrey Shaw, on his own, killed Janet Muller. That was just his way of um, avoiding his responsibilities. I don't think the judge believed him from the remarks made when Geoffrey Shaw was sentenced. Even the judge felt quite strongly that he was lying and in his summing up, he actually accused him of that. The jury retired and they were out for nine hours, 42 minutes, which... You know, a lot, of, a lot of cases the jury comes back very quickly when it's open and shut. You can tell that there was enough reasonable doubt for them to have spent a long time debating his innocence or guilt. And the verdict they came to was that he wasn't guilty of murder. The jury found that on the evidence as presented that they couldn't convict on murder, but they could convict on manslaughter. And as a consequence of that, the, uh, the judge felt quite strongly that he received the maximum sentence that he could give for manslaughter, which was 17 years, which is a significant sentence for that offence. I, I think justice was served by the, um, the sentencing that was uh, given. That is very unheard of. I hope that brings some comfort to Janet's family. Since Christopher Jeffrey Shaw's trial for murder and his conviction for manslaughter, there's been an inquest into the circumstances around Janet's death. The court case in the Crown Court, the inquest in the Coroner's Court, both raised a great many questions, I think, about the way Janet was cared for while she was in Millview Hospital. The family brought a civil action against the NHS Trust that runs Millview Hospital. And that case, as far as I understand, was settled. The Trust issued a very public apology. Measures have been taken since then to make sure that when somebody is kept there, it is much more secure if they're being detained there for their own safety. I still can't believe she's there. Janet's mum, Ramona, and her twin sister, Selena, continue to learn about their grief. You expect a person to react in certain ways and things like this happen. And I realized we didn't, we didn't accept what happened. There was times of crying.
crying, screaming, you know, changing all the time from one minute to the next. I remember when he flew home, Selena, she was crying the whole flight, saying that she's leaving Janet behind because we have to go home without her. It says when love would find a way to heaven and memories would be steps, we would climb up and bring you back. I'm going to bed every night, hearing her screaming for mommy before she died. <laughs>